Street in Marrickville all my life. I have a few issues with change. But um, <laughs> when I was a kid growing up there, my street was full of Greek and Italian families. But since 2005, there have been 18 gay and lesbian couples living in my street. And we are planning to overthrow the suburb. <laughs> we don't even call it Marrickville anymore. We call it Villa Marique. <laughs> You should be there on a Saturday afternoon when everyone is mixing cocktails and martinis. Don't bend over, you're going to end up with an olive up your ass. She's a drag queen next door. Uh, the books are... Uh, are you right then? The books in my street are all thin. They all go to the gym, they all go to Fitness First in Newtown, or as I like to call it, Fitness Fist. And, um, they're immaculately groomed. They live in beautifully renovated homes with polished floorboards, tongue and groove. Antique, Restoration Federation reproduction furniture, neoclassical upholstery with soft furnishings in a complimentary colourway. If a flying saucer landed in our street, we would turn it over to see if it was made by Wedgwood or Noritake. <laughs> are pathological renovators. Gay boys are having orgasms in freedom stores. I, I have a friend who can't show his face in Ikea because they're still mopping up the mess after his last visit. But I don't renovate the house and I don't go to Fitness First in Newtown, I don't go to Mardi Gras, I don't even wear red ribbons. I'm a failure as a homosexual. But um, do you know I'm the only person I know who doesn't own a pornographic movie? And that isn't because I'm too embarrassed to buy one, it's because I refuse to pay $45 for any DVD that doesn't have Bette Midler or Kevin Bacon in it. <laughs> and I've been thinking recently, um, doesn't pedophilia sound like a flower? <laughs> so I'm just going into the garden to pick a bunch of pedophilia for the table. This is how you do a lovely bunch of pedophilia for you. Um, the lesbians in Marrickville are fantastic. I love Marrickville lessos. They're fucking big and butch, but I love them. And they all have dogs. And they never have one dog. They always have two dogs. And they are never little dogs. They are fuck off big dogs. <laughs> and they call one Aretha and the other one Franklin. <laughs> One lesbian couple in my street has real children. They do. No, they have two boys. Um, and each girl had a baby. And they were both artificially inseminated by the same man. So the boys are really brothers. Which, look, and I think that is beautiful. I think it's so 2012. It is so modern family in a Penny Wong sort of way. But, um, but, um, but the, boy, the girls, um, they still put the boys on leads and walk them twice a day. And the kids take a dump right outside my front door. I fucking hate that. Um, but I was talking to um, I was talking to one of those girls this afternoon, um, Janine, and she was um, telling me that she'd been to the gyno for an internal. You see, I know all the jargon, even though I've never eaten at that restaurant. But, um, but, um, but she was telling me her doctor told her that she had the cleanest vagina he had ever seen, and she said, "Of course I do. I get a woman in twice a week." Um, pardon me, I don't have children, I know you're shocked. Um, but if I did, had God blessed me with the patter of little feet, I'd love three. One of each. And um, even though, I don't know kids, but I did, for a long time I worked in a toy shop. 
um, over at Hunter's Hill. And it was pretty schmancy, it was a beautiful shop. Kate Blanchett used to come in with the kids and everything, it was lovely. And um, one day, one morning, a young woman came in, she would have been in her late 20s, early 30s. She was immaculately groomed. And I later found out that she was married to a major Sydney property developer. And she had never had a job, and she had never worked a day in her life. She was the real deal desperate housewife. And I'm talking her outfit, she was in an Armani sweater, Alexander McQueen, um, boots, Escada jeans, Fendi handbag, Louis Vuitton sunglasses, um, Chanel scarf. Her wardrobe easily was worth $24,000 to $28,000. And this is at the local shops on a Wednesday morning. She had her hair straightened three times a week by Joe Bailey. And I'm not talking at Joe Bailey's, I'm talking by Joe Bailey. He went to her house. Anyway, she's walking around the shop and she gets to um, the aisle where the educational toys are. And, that's my drum. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and she gets to the aisle where the educational toys are and she gets to these flip cards. There are three piles of cards and the first pile has um, an image on it, the second pile has a prefix and the third pile has a suffix. So you might have a picture of a chair and then you'll have a CH and an AIR and it teaches the kids to spell. Pretty straightforward, so I think. Anyway, she gets to this and she said to me, you have a beautiful store here. I said, thank you. I said, we really like it. And she said, these educational um, aids, she, she said, these are fantastic. And I said, yeah, no, they are. I said, they're great for kids when they start school. And she said, now tell me, do these come with instructions? <laughs> and I said, darling, that's a spelling aid. That's the instructional part. And, like, she looked a million dollars, but she was as dumb as dog shit. I swear to God, that woman would study for a pap test. And can you, in the face of that, Joe Hockey goes on national television and tells Penny Wong that gay and lesbian couples are depriving children are depriving children of a normal family life. Like, what is the fucking worst thing that is going to happen? Like, if a gay couple adopted children, like what? We're going to teach them how to be fabulous. For fuck's sake. <laughs> when I was a kid, I told people my name was Luke. And, um... <laughs> I did... <laughs> I've got um, an, an, an older cousin of, um, of mine, um, he's um, older, um, he's single, uh, we call him Han Solo, and, um, <laughs> and then there's my other cousin Rebecca, we call her Chewy, Chewbacca, because she's a carpet muncher, and, um, <laughs> and then of course the youngest, we call him Jabba the Slut. But anyway. <laughs> Oh dear. I was having a 69 with a guy last night. Beautiful segue. I'm seamless. Uh, and I, surprise, surprise, Meg and I are all sex, fucking best friends. And, but I don't think this guy was very smart. I don't think he knew what we were supposed to be doing. No, because it was an accident, but I farted. And, and then I farted again. And he jumped out of bed and I said, what are you doing? And he said, fucking, I am not hanging around for another 67 of those. <laughs> I was on a dance party harbour cruise recently. 500 pups in a manly ferry, boom boom. And, um, and I looked at, I looked at, I'll get to you later. Um, you will feature. Um, and, um, and I looked around and I thought, if this boat sinks tonight, tomorrow, not one woman in Sydney is going to have anyone to do her hair. There were a lot of drag queens on that boat because, believe it or not, gay men love getting dressed up. They do. And I feel very close to you. I feel like I can share this with you. I have been known to pop on a frog myself on occasion. I have. On a Sunday morning, usually, after church, when I'm at home alone, and, um... <laughs> bit of a wig, a pair of high heels, something butch in chiffon. I pop on a bit of disco, a bit of Donna Summer, a bit of Diana Ross. I become an open channel for Liza Minnelli to perform through. <laughs> And it happens every time. There is always a knock at the door, and it's always the fucking Mormons. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elder Martin, and this is Elder Jonathan. Can we interest you in the Book of Mormon? Well, these boys took one look at me, and I could see the piss running out of their calico underpants. <laughs> I was 
friendly. I invited them in. Come on, boys. Don't I look like I could take you to heaven? They ran. Fucking pistols and I chased them. Get back here, you bastards. But they outran me. It's the fucking heels. They do you in every time. But I love drag queens and I think we need more drag queens and I think we need more gays in the military. I do. I think we need me in the fucking army. I do. I would, yes. I would hate the uniform, but I would accessorise with it beautifully. And I think I'd be very good with the major's privates. Um, but I really, I really just want to get to the, I want to get to the front line, I want to get to the trenches. I did spend time in Iraq. He's my next door neighbour. But um, I really... I really would love to get to the Middle East because I would just walk straight up to the other side and just say, listen! We don't have to kill each other. We can discuss this. Um, this is about communication. And we actually have a lot more in common than you think. You're the Muslim brothers and I went to the Christian brothers. Actually, do you speak English? Actually, you're quite a young, strapping, corn-fed, exotic-looking enemy soldier, aren't you? We don't have to blow each other's heads off. <laughs> I don't need a gun to shoot a lot. It was unique. Except, of course, maybe the Bottoms Up Bar in the Rex Hotel. That's another story in another show. And, um, but the taxi club had an amazing ambience. Decades and decades of spilt beer, cigarette ash, and God knows what else had left that carpet a stinking, <laughs> sticky mass of mulch. The permanently foggy air was stale with rancid cigarette smoke. The patronage was diverse, to say the least. Shift workers, footy players, tradies, office workers, solicitors, lawyers, yuppies, homeless people, and of course the taxi club's welcome mat was always out for drag queens and their trade. All ages, races and breeds coexisting in a weird, unnatural harmony that would leave most people just fucking scratching their heads in bewilderment. And also bear in mind, it was, um, it was 1979, so it was still a criminal offence to be, not only be a homosexual in New South Wales, but also to appear in public dressed as the opposite sex. So there was a criminal stamp, not only on being gay, but also on being a drag queen. So we lived outside of mainstream culture. We lived outside the law, and we loved it. We lived outside of fucking reality. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Back to Friday night. Now, we would normally get to the taxi club just after midnight, and in no time at all, Lucy Cocktail would be shit-faced <laughs> and crawling around on all fours between the poker machines looking for loose change. She was the resourceful one in our group. Um, uh, um, uh, Victoria would be downstairs in the car park with a mouthful, and uh, Phyllis would be in the men's toilet with a mouthful, Thorn would be chockers up some poor bastard in a dark corner of the dance floor. And of course, um, Mercedes would be at the bar holding court. Now before too long, the Westie Walk boys would arrive. Now they were young men from the suburbs who would make their way into town on a Friday night to get a skinful and, um, and drop their dacks and be relieved of the load that had been their burden all week. And I can hear Mercedes now. Thank Christ! It's about time. I thought you were never going to get here. But you know how much I love a bit of cheesy, uncut, dago dick. <laughs> Putrid. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, like, drag queens and Westie boys were an interesting combination because those boys knew the drag queens weren't real women, but it didn't matter. Because in a funny sort of way, the taxi club served a higher purpose. Like, it was really about, well, it was religious. It was a, a communion... Of, um, it was a, a communion of individuals. Um, then at about 7 o'clock in the morning, um, Barry behind the bar would call last drinks. And we would have a couple, a couple more guzzles and then we would roll down the stairs onto Flinders Street and into the light of day. That was ugly. The taxi club closed from 7 o'clock until 8 o'clock every morning. 
one hour. <laughs> that was it. Just enough time to run the hoover over and mop up the slops and schlep out the punters, most of whom were comatose and face down in their own filth. <laughs> anyway, out on the street, we would um, then begin our return pilgrimage to Victoria's cosy nest at the bottom end of the Golden Mile. That was Oxford Street in, um, in those halcyon days. And um, it was time for rest and recuperation. And, um, and thank God we didn't write ourselves off totally because that was only Friday night and we still had Saturday night ahead of us and that was our really big night out for the week. And, um, and so our shenanigans continued, um, but not forever. Um, Mercedes leapt up the retail ladder, she now works for Louis Vuitton. Um, Phyllis went bush. Um, Victoria fled to Perth to lead a quiet suburban existence over there and my other mates encountered a virus that at that time none of us knew the consequences of. But they were crazy times and I went back to the taxi club about a decade later and that wasn't pretty um, because I had an altercation with the law and um, I was arrested for DUI and that's, no, no, it's never a good look. Not at six o'clock in the morning, not outside the taxi club on Christmas Eve. And, um, <laughs> but like, I wasn't blind drunk. I was just a bit tipsy. Okay, I was shit-faced, but anyway. <laughs> I would stand up by myself and I only vomited once and I got it all in the bowl. <laughs> and there was just, there was only one little bit of wear on the front of the jeans, but anyway. <laughs> But that was nothing. Those jeans, remember it was the 80s, those jeans were so, de they were so distressed, they needed to be on medication. Um, they hated, I, the knees were completely ripped out of them and so was the arse. And when you get arrested in Darlinghurst, they take you to Goulburn Street Police Station, which is that big fuck off concrete bunker. And so I was in there at the reception desk and they were processing my charge sheet. This sounds so law and order, I love it. And I'm, so SVU. And um, I think Jimmy Spitz is going to come out, isn't it? But um, it's the old law and order, not the new one. And um, so anyway, there, this old cop who would have been in his 60s comes out, he has a terrific sense of humour and he looks me up and down and he sees the arse out of my jeans and he goes, fucking big night at the taxi club, eh mate? <laughs> and then this young constable, who was probably 11, um, <laughs> took me to fingerprint me. And remember, it's the old days. So in the old days, they've got to roll your fingers on the ink pad and then they put you, you're not in, you don't. Um, they roll your fingers on the ink pad, just like in Homicide and Division 4, and then they roll them on um, on the, the cards. And so this kid's, I don't know, like I said, he's probably 11. He's holding my hand and he goes, just hold your hand still. And I said, I am. It's yours that are shaking. <laughs> and I said, don't you have the face of a mother's angel? <laughs> Do you know, I could pop you in my top pocket and take you home with me. And couldn't I do some damage then? They couldn't get me out of that police station faster. They gave me a cab charge. I went back to the taxi club. I had a fucking car. Oh, but it's a party, dog. Let's turn some music again. <laughs> <laughs> 